Morning, ladies and gents. Uh, Simon Brown here, and I'm joined by uh, Jana Rasmus, who's an executive director at One Invest. Uh, today, we're going to be talking commodities and uh, going through the, the 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 commodity ETFs and ETNs from One Invest. If you've got questions, drop them into the Q and A box. Certainly, we have got time for some questions, uh, and if need be, I'll park them for the end unless they're particular to where we are in the conversation. Johanna, appreciate your time today. We are, of course, a couple of hours ahead of uh, a national election in South Africa, national and provincial. I was saying before we hit the, the go live button, what we're not expecting is our election to have any impact on commodity prices, really. But of course, they could impact the czar. Oh, good day, Simon. Always, um, always glad to be back on your show. Yeah, I think uh, my, my view, I share that with you. Um, I think the elections um, will have no impact on commodity prices, and that's as we always said. Commodities are global, global trade globally, mm -hmm. and have got a relevance in the globe. Where South Africa's might be a big producer of some of them, has very li little impact on the general demand side of it. So, yeah, I tend to agree. I think these elections is going to have no impact on the commodity prices, and depending on which way they go might have a benefit for the RAND because um, I see the, the, the RAND's definitely wanting to be strengthened over the last two weeks, and hopefully that continues. Yeah, it's certainly we've been seeing some foreigners buying our bonds, which I don't know when that's been a long time since foreigners have been buying our bond, but that does uh, help some of the, the RAND strength we've been seeing. Commodities in of themselves, I mean, I, I've been in this market long enough to, to, to remember the phrase was, you know, the only time you buy gold is when you close a short. Um, but my sense is that from an investor perspective, and it's probably in part because if I go back, let's go back 20 years, for me to buy a commodity, I could buy a Kruger Rand. That was about it. My other exposure was via the miners. These days with the one invest uh, ETFs and ETNs, my, my ability to get exposure to commodities is so much easier in that they now become sort of that important part of the portfolio, which they always were, but I just didn't have the capacity. Yeah. No, that's spot on. And that's why we developed the, the commodity ETFs and ETNs is in order to democratize the investment into these commodities for every investor. And the nice thing, and I always say this, the nice thing about the, the, the ETFs and the ETNs is they don't distinguish if you're a large institutional investor or a small retail investor. You get all the, you get the same price. There's no different fee classes like with unit trusts and, and other asset managed manager funds you all your metal is the sec as secure as everybody's and you can trade in it in, into it and out of it as easy as any other institutional investor so it really opens the door as a retail investor to access these products which was generally before the advent of etfs and etns only um only the, the the market for some of the professional traders like your big link calls, traffic gurus and that. And now you can actually, as a retail investor, have access to commodities um, on the same terms. Yeah, I take that point. I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, it it, it I, I'm so, I'm sort of out there with the the institutions, and it does mean that I can do you know proper diverse portfolios. My grandfather, who who traded from the 1920s into the 80s, you know, he was always like, "You've got to have some gold. You've got to have some commodity." And I remember saying to him, "But how?" Well, if I it was Kruger Rands, um, and we'll talk around that in a moment. There's also the distinction between commodities and and the miners themselves. Uh, yes. we, we see commodities are markedly less volatile, and that's because of the leverage effect. And there's always the debate. And I know, and you know, personally, I hold a a gold ETF and a gold miner. My miner is a lot more volatile than 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 my ETF. Yeah. So within the mines, and 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 this is this is how one has to look at it. So let's start off with a commodity ETF. When I hold the gold ETF. I'm taking the exposure of the dollar gold price and, and what that translates to in the South African listed ETFs is my ETF price will move up and down as the price of dollar gold moves up and down, as well as the rand dollar exchange rates. So you do have a bit of a rand hedge in there as well. The benefit of it is you don't have to hold a physical Kruger rand as you as you 
mentioned. And, yeah. and buying a Kruger Rand is easy. Selling a Kruger Rand is a lot harder. And storing <laughs> a Kruger Rand is even harder. So <laughs> under your bed is probably not the best place. Um, and so you get that translation. And then you don't have to go through any exchange control approvals or ex, um, expatriate your money offshore to get this dollar gold exposure. So there's really a lot of benefits. And, and the price of that is comes at 25 basis points. It's, it's really, it's very cheap. Where you then buy and you can get similar exposure to gold through the producers, but then now adds other complexities. One is you're adding the uh, the operational complexity of that uh, producer itself. You're limiting yourself to geog uh, geography. If you're buying it on the JC, it's mostly South African miners, which have diversified into other areas on the globe, but but it remains South African miners. And, and, and then to the extent as well is a lot of them have other operations as well and sort of diversifying as well. So it's there's there's not that many pure gold plays left out there outside of just going straight into an ETF. Um, and and but the flip side and and as you aware, Simon, is the commodity, the equity would give you gearing. So if it goes well, it can give you that additional gearing where, where but it but it can count against you as well. So you must really have a, a firm view on on the producer specifically versus having a general view on gold and and gold over the last 20 years has done quite well um through all the turmoil um still seen as alternative edge um for and, and a good hedge funds portfolio yeah and i take and i remember my grandfather and i keep on going back to him because he taught me about markets he always said you hold gold you trade the gold miners um, and, and, and as yeah. I said, for him, it was ETFs and, and the, oh, sorry, it was Kruger and, and the trick was, and I remember the, 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 the costs and the spreads and the fees. And then to your point, I've got to go and hide it under the bed. If you're looking at the, at the, 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 the one invest gold ETF. It is, it, it's a hundred of these is going to equal an, an ounce, uh, 25 basis yeah. points is the, the fee. Uh, and for importantly, uh, that is a little bit cheaper than the popular gold ETF on, on the JSC. Johan won't say that, but I definitely <laughs> will. Um, and, and, and you mentioned 20 years. I mean, I, I vaguely remember the early 80s when gold hit 800 odd. And that's because, as I said, my grandfather. And then there was 20 years of it just going south. I mean, fortunately, he passed and never got to see just how bad it got. Uh, and then, of course, we had Gordon Brown, the exchequer of the UK, selling in the early 2000s at around $250. But pretty much since then, gold has done what it says on the sticker. And if you'd been buying back then at that $250 from Gordon Brown, you have 10 X in, in, in 20 years, which is a, yeah, that's a 10 bagger yep. in, in what we call the, you know, the most boring thing to own in the world. Yeah. So Simon and gold's currently trading at around $2,350 an ounce. Plus then you add the Rand dollar exchange rate over the 20 years uh, into that as well. So um, you gold, gold, you would have done very, very well just holding it because one, you would have had the gold hedge, and two, you would have had the Rand dollar hedge as well. So you would have really hedged the South African portfolio against those moves very, very well. Yeah, you've had both moves. And and I mean, partly, I suppose it's because we're back in a world of inflation. And I've had a couple of conversations with folks over the last year or so, which really does, and, and their talk is that we're not back, we're not going back to the 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 you know, really, really low inflation and really, really low interest rate environment. We are, they talk around decarbonization. They talk around the demographic uh, dividend that we're seeing with the aging population. Uh, we, we talk around uh, deglobalization, sometimes called onshoring as a result of the pandemic. There's a lot out there to say that as much as, as, as gold has done well, it, it probably got a good future going forward. There were, and I think it was some guys from BMP Paribas we were talking four thousand dollars an ounce in the near term. Look, my target is two and a half, and and I've had that for a while. But there's a there's a there's a story behind gold that says it it hasn't been the flash in the pan, and if anything, it's kind of matured into 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 its into its space. 
Yeah. So, so we've seen gold run relatively hard over the last six months, where where it quickly jumped into the two thousand and and two thousand four hundred dollars an ounce. It's it's pulled back a bit, and and the the pullback is I think largely driven by um, the delay or the expected delay in the U.S. rate cuts. So mm -hmm. everybody is saying that um, given the inflation is still high in the U.S., that, that they're just delaying those rate cuts. But what everybody is expecting is one that once that rates start cutting, that gold is going to, and we know it's going to happen at some stage, there needs to be a bit of stimulus into the economy and the elections, the US elections coming up and that. So they, they need to be seen to be doing something for the economy there. But um, as that rate cuts come in, we'll see, in my view is we'll see another run in the gold price on the one hand. And then, and then the other one is there's a lot of geopolitical risks currently going on. Ukraine, Ukraine, Russia is still carrying on sanctions there. there it almost seems like a bit of an escalation in Israel-Palestine and a lot of uncertainty driven there. And then what we are also just seeing, if you have a look and if you follow the sovereigns around the world and and what you can term their balance sheets, their central bank's balance sheets, you see they've been accumulating yeah. gold over the last year and a half. So there's definitely a move by what's called the big buyers of gold to accumulate positions. So no, I think I think there's definitely got a – the gold's got a run in it still left. And it's it's still as, – as a lot of this is going on in the world, the government's people, institutional investors and investors – are, are moving back to to gold, which gives that sense of security and and the certainty of the asset value, if I can put it that way. And it's a it's a hard thing to describe. What is the value of gold? Well, it's 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 what the the buyers say it is, and and yeah. that because it's unlike the other unlike the other commodities, gold is a store of value, and and that where other commodities are generally consumed. Yeah, uh, that's at that point. And the central bank buying has been, I chat with the World Gold Council, they do their quarterly report. Uh, yeah. and, and there's been the one trend over the last couple of years has been central bank buying. And and it's it's broadly across. It's not just, you know, and there's a little bit of sales. We saw some sales out of Turkey and I think one of the other EMs. Uh, but there's net buying in that space. What really struck me as well with the last gold report, which would have been for Q1 of this year, uh, we actually seen Chinese citizens buying. Now, Indian citizens are, are often buyers, but they're price sensitive. But the Chinese story was interesting. When I spoke to uh, the World Gold Council, they were talking around how the logic there is that with the Chinese stock market having been under pressure and the housing market really under pressure, they're looking for an investment and, and, and they've swung to gold. And seemingly without that concern around uh, uh, you know, price sensitivity, um, and of course, I mean, China, what, one point something, one point four uh, uh, billion people. It, it is just. I, I go back to my earlier point. For someone who was dismissive of gold for for a very very long time, uh, I now have both gold ETFs and I have uh, gold miners, and it still just feels a little weird. But you know what? As long as they're going from bottom left to top right, um, I can live with the, the 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 weirdness of it without too much stress at all. Yeah, one of one of the things, and I, I've touched on it a couple of times, is is the, a lot of the value in buying gold as well is is protecting against currency devaluation. Yeah. So if your if your home currency start, or if there's a concern that your home currency devalues or or is going to weaken, it is not a bad hedge either to just one buy that dollar gold and and whatever gold you buy fundamentally at the end of the day is priced in dollars like any any commodity so so i know a lot of people look at it and when we see it on the news this evening it shows a rand price but all commodities are priced in dollars at the end of the day yeah so you get that that dollar hedge that rand hedge and yes in the short term sometimes the rand is strengthening but longer term not pgms have been it been a bit of a wild ride. Uh, 2021, I, I can't even remember where rhodium got to, but we had platinum and palladium going absolutely crazy. Uh, three ETFs in this space. A quick point on, on ETF versus ETN. The gold and these three PGMs, 
they are you physically actually holding the the underlines yes yeah so so and 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 let's be clear so both with the with all the etfs they are that gold and that commodity is held in a segregated account mm -hmm. in separate vaults not by standard bank but by the etf company so so investors in in the one invest etfs take no standard bank risk yeah. if something happens to standard bank you're more than welcome if you've got the necessary licenses go to London, collect your gold or your platinum or palladium or rhodium, and off you go. With the ETN, you are taking Standard Bank risk because what Standard Bank writes you in the investment note and says, we will pay you the performance of the underlying commodity. Um, I know immediately a lot of people, oh, I don't want to take Standard Bank risk. Look, most people are happy to have a deposit account with Standard Bank and, and have money with Standard Bank it is exactly the same risk. So you're not taking additional risk in an ETN than depositing money with Standard Bank. And Standard Bank being one of the big four or five banks in the country, for now, you're probably safe as houses, yeah, to, look, be, I, to, be, to be quite honest. Yeah, I always take the view, if, 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 if Standard Bank's the problem in my life, I've got bigger problems in my portfolio. I'm probably queuing at Bright Bridge um, to, to head out. The PGM space... Yeah has been more troubled and, and, and we were saying before we hit the record button we got a great yes. question from Narina Frisser as well talking around I, I chatted with Fivas Perilous from Theresa earlier today uh, Neil Frondman has certainly been saying but this morning they were saying he's seeing some some bits of green shoots in the PGM space uh, Neil Frondman was saying it about two or so months ago and, and the argument is we've seen supply come out of the market, which is classic uh, uh, commodity cycle. At, at the top, everyone's trying to bring as much supply in. And at the bottom of the price, that that sort of supply starts coming out. We've seen a move from EV to hybrid to a fair degree. Um, and of course, there's also the, the, the age of cars on the roads around the world, which is hitting 14 years, which apparently is about the oldest that we've ever seen. There certainly is a and I want to say compelling, and maybe not even a short term, but but it, the, the the prices have perhaps found a bit of a bottom in the in in the PGM space, and even platinum is is looking a bit uh, a positive. I mean, certainly moving back above a thousand. It it green shoots is a big word, but there's perhaps certainly some positivity, yeah. and certainly from the miners when I chat to the PGM miners. Yeah, I think uh, I tend to agree. I, I hear the word green shoots for me. I think one has to be quite think carefully on where the, that terminology is coming from. And what I mean yeah. by that is which producers are saying it. So South African producers are predominantly slanted again to, to the mix, if you call it, that's coming out the ground to, to a large about 60, 65% of the mix of the PGM metals out of South Africa is uh, platinum um, of, and, and then it's about, Call it thirty percent palladium, and then and then the rest is rhodium, ruthenium, and iridium. Iridium, and so so a lot of the basket price in South Africa is pegged to how well and what the demand for for platinum is. What we've seen over the last couple of years is, is a couple of things happen. The one is um, there is still quite a lot of platinum stockpile. But the, the future for platinum is currently the one that everybody's focusing on and the green shoot because there's been a lot of substitution for palladium um, in the catalytic converters to platinum. So what they commonly refer to as the white coats at, at, the, at, the, at the chemistry labs that's been busy um, working on the environmental issues around autocats and normal vehicles. Because what you had is you had ten years ago, platinum platinum was about two, three thousand, two, two and a half thousand dollars an ounce. Palladium was very, very cheap. It went all the way down five, around five hundred thousand, five hundred dollars an ounce. Then you had the surge in palladium as it became the cheaper metal to put in the catalytic converters, and the price inverted. Platinum dropped down to below a thousand. Palladium ramped up to 3,000. 
then the white coat started working again and substituting the more expensive metal for the cheaper metal. And we're now back at the, at, at, at the price inverse of palladium, palladium being cheaper than, than platinum. And that has now been holding steady for the last couple of months because of what they call the substitution effect into your normal, um, they refer to as ice vehicles, but it's our normal combustion vehicles. Yeah. So that's the one green shoot that's happened and you see the reversion in price between the two metals. The other one is platinum has been touted as the greener metal being um, um, used in potentially hydrogen engines, potentially in battery electric. But as, as we're seeing the world now starting to, to pivot to a more hybrid engines that that's uses, and, and that is, again, platinum. So, so that's where the... the what I would call the the terminology of green shoots around platinum has come out, and and why you're seeing that price strengthening in comparison to to palladium's price coming off a lot. Rhodium's price, of course, that has come down massively from its all time highs. It's been trading quite sideways at about between four and a half and five thousand uh, dollars an ounce. That looks like it is still holding steady there, and it's sort of found its, and I don't want to say it's found its floor, but it's found its its equilibrium. This is a lot more than what um, rhodium was trading at 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was trading at about $1,000. Yeah. But it, we, we saw a similar cycle. It was trading at $1,000. It ramped up to 10000 came crashing down as the metal became expensive, traded cheaply, got substituted quite a lot into the into the catalytic converters as the euro and the and the emission standards got a lot stringer, pushed up the price a lot, got substituted out and dropped back to a to a price of about four four and a half, four seven um, thousand dollars an ounce. So so th those are how those metals work interdependently. Add to that, you've got a broader economic view that you have to take. Is there is there new cars being sold? As you rightfully said, cars are are, are, are being driven longer. I think the in COVID did play a role in that because for two years people didn't drive their cars, so they didn't put miles on them, so they that's could hold point. them a yeah. lot longer. Yeah, yeah. So so and, and so I think that's why we're seeing now. There's 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 hopefully. Um, if there's the expectation U.S. inflation coming out, coming down, um, rates coming down, bit of stimulus in the global economy, that there that there might be a bit of an increased demand in cars. There is the demand for hybrids and 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 all of that. So yeah, I think there might be a bit of a bit of a run and a bit of a demand for maybe not all the PGMs, but some of them going forward. Yeah, I take a point on that. What about recycling? Because of course you put this. Very precious. I mean, even at a thousand dollars an ounce, let's not kid us. I mean, that you know, it's a thousand dollars an ounce. You put that into the tailpipe of a vehicle. Uh, a, a lot of that gets recycled. Do we have any sense of of how much recycling? Because I mean, gold has some recycling. It's relatively small. Yep. Uh, copper has recycling, but also relatively small, I suspect. Yeah. So 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 PGM recycling is quite a big thing, and as with the older vintages of cars when the metals were cheaper and that there was an, and less technology that went into it, you found um, quite a lot of, quite a lot of the catalytic converters were PGM rich. Um, in there, you have to look at vintages and what I refer to as vintages is when were the cars made in terms, and that would determine um, one, does the catalytic converter contain more platinum or palladium? Mm -hmm. Is there rhodium in it? All of that, but that but that's just scratching the surface. It's how often these cars come to market, what the whole cost is between the, the let's call it the collectors, i.e. the scrap yards getting hold of a catalytic converter, and it then going through the whole process, and then also the refining process of that again. Where, where some of the metals like rhodium don't refine very easily and mm -hmm. don't refine very well either. So, so it, it starts seizing up the, the, the whole chemistry set. And, the, and then so I know there's, a, there's expectation. And, and if you listen to some of the news um, coming out, they say 
China will be self-sufficient in palladium in the next four or five years. I, I, I just don't buy that in total because you do have the growth um, and, and you do have the emission standards going up. And what we've also seen in South Africa is, is you do see supply coming down. So yeah. um, it's a question of, of, of the mines and the cost of mining, all of that starting. It's not, it's not as easy as just saying recycling is going to take over and, and um, it's going to fill up the, the shortfall. Definitely not. Yeah. It's, it's always a fine balance. Um, the other thing to remember is these are long cycles. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's not like soft commodities. There's a shortage of sunflowers. Okay, we can plant sunflowers, and within one year, you you fine. Um, these to to develop mines, to to shutter mines, to to build recycling plants. All of these these are five to seven to ten year cycles um, that that one looks at. Yeah, well, even longer. I mean, there was a FT article I think early this year. Uh, from discovery to production uh, in, 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 in commodities, not agri, but in uh, sort of precious and the like industrial, uh, 15 years. And that was the gold field, that recent gold mine that they opened up, literally 15 years from when they discovered it to when they got it. A great question coming from Tanda Sizwe, uh, and they're asking about the, 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 the fee, right? There's a total expense ratio. We pay a fee. It, it's between you know, 25 points or depending on what the commodity is. Most ETF issuers take that out of the dividend. You, of course, don't pay dividends here. There's no distributions. So what we see is a slight lag in the price because you're effectively taking it out of the price instead. Yes, yes uh, it's a very good question. It's quite a technical question because in order, so, so in order to cover the cost, and this is the insurance, the storage, the, the management fee, all of that, it's all inclusive in that 25 basis points for the gold. Mm -hmm. And how we, how we take that out is every day um, we calculate the value of the fund. So for the investors in the fund, and it's a 25 per annum cost. And every day we calculate what that is a daily cost on the total gold in the vault. And we reduce that gold holding by that small part on a monthly basis. So every month, the fund will sell that value of accrued uh, daily fee on a month, pay all the costs, pay all the storage. And, and that's why I say, as an investor, you take no standard bank risk because it's effectively self-sufficient on that. Yeah. And that's on your slide. So 100 ETF units roughly equate an ounce of gold. But that gets less and less and less every day by the gold that it reduces and 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 that small amount of gold that gets sold. Yeah. And, and that's why we I, see that. Yeah, they're spot on. And that's why we see a difference in the the different uh, 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 same commodity, but different ETF, because depending how long they've been listed and what the fee yes. is, they've had a little bit, a little bit uh, uh, more coming out. I want to move on to the, the yes. energies. And and Can I just touch on that. Yeah. Sorry, Simon, before we move in. And and I think that's quite important to touch on that is while the one ETF might be cheaper or more expensive than the other one, with a more expensive ETF, you're buying more gold mm -hmm. because the holding is larger. And when you want gold exposure, are you gonna pay you want more gold? So yeah. so a lot of people <laughs> say, but why is the one more cheaper than the other one? It's it's not as straightforward as that. So apologies for interrupting. No, 100%. I want to move on to to the energies. And I, I, I've kind of thrown uh, copper in here for degree. You'd had the two ETNs there because they exchange traded notes. They have an expiry date. They had expired a couple of years ago. We got the new ones being issued. The key difference was that the oil went from West Texas uh, to, 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 to Brent. Um, and I think I'm not convinced here. I, I, as I look at that, is the oil ETN a hundredth of a barrel, or is it a fiftieth of a barrel? It's a fiftieth of a barrel, and those those um, exposures do change because the underlying instruments are futures. Yeah. And why it's futures is because just from a practical, and this is also why we do copper and oil as ETNs and not ETFs is. Standard Bank's basement is not big enough to hold <laughs> gallons and gallons of crumbs of oil or, or piles of copper. So, 
and, and, and practically from insuring and making sure that the, that the oil or the copper is safe and insurance and storage, it's just not practical to do as an ETF. And that's why we do them as ETNs. And, but because they're ETNs, they're futures-based mm-hmm. because there's no effective spot market in that. And because of that, you get what is called the roll yield. So as, as we roll from the, the near liquid futures to the next li- most liquid futures, your amount invested doesn't change, but the amount of exposure that you okay. can buy increases and decreases. So, so that's why that, that, that linkage to how much of the commodity you're exposed to does change. And, and that's quite important to remember with the, with the ETFs. Yeah, yeah. So that was the the theoretical at, at issue price. And oil, I mean, oil's been another one. And and I mean, I, I remember oil at what, $150 in, in 2008. Uh, it spiked in uh, February of 22 when, when Russia invaded Ukraine. But one of the big changes, I think, over the last many decades has been perhaps the less influence of OPEC, notwithstanding they've expanded to OPEC plus. And the big one has been fracking in the US, which has fairly fundamentally changed the the sort of global dynamics in oil, notwithstanding oil is still a, a conflict risk uh, 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 asset because of where it is, and, and particularly with Russia. And truthfully, you know, global GDP of five versus global GDP of 1% are going to have impacts on, on, on demand and ultimately that oil price. Yeah, uh, I tend to agree. Uh, I think, um, I'll reiterate what you say, the US has become a big oil producer in itself, where it used to be an oil dependent country, yeah. it's now become a producer. OPEC, yes, less less sensitivities in the market and price, but you don't you still see over geopolitical events that it does change and it does put some volatility in that price. But I tend to agree if if we think that there is going to be a decrease in in global um, in the interest rates. It's going to stimulate more economic activity. Um, for my sense, what my rationale tells me is there is going to be increased demand. Um, we say there might be increased vehicles, more increased economic activity. And I do think there is a real risk of increasing oil prices going forward. And not because of geopolitical tensions, but because of increased economic activity. Yeah. Uh, John, you're asking if there's a minimum amount to invest in the SB oil or SB uh, copper. The answer is no. Uh, your broker might have, but I mean, literally it's one unit. So you could go and buy a single unit uh, and 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 have the exposure. And of course, Easy Equity slices them up and will give you small amounts. So but do watch the minimum brokerage fee. That's another whole story. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, Standard Bank, is not, as the issuer, is not going to say you have to put in a certain particular uh, uh, amount. The, the big one, perhaps, Johan, is, is copper. And Irina Fissel was saying, how do we invest in the physical commodities required to drive the transition to clean energy? Hydrogen, well, well PGMs with the hydrogen economy, uh, and, and I know that uh, Theresa is looking at, at, at battery storage in that space, plays a part there. But but the really big one is is is, is, is copper. And it, it depends which copper bull you, you talk to. Um, but there are a lot of them. And they will talk around in terms of, how much copper we need for the, the the transition to to renewable energy, which Schroders says is going to be about a hundred and twenty trillion dollars spend over the next couple of decades. Uh, all these chips that that Nvidia Nvidia is making, they've got copper in them. This, perhaps more than anything, is the is the green metal out there with with a, a bit of a pullback in the last couple of days. There seemed to be a bit of a squeeze when the the LME banned Russia. Uh, from selling, uh, following on from Chicago, but but copper seems to be the green metal. Yeah, I think I think it's the it's I, I term it the re-electrification of the world, yeah. and it is one of the bigger inputs um, out there, and the the demand is just increasing. And if you if you if you just read all all the news and and you look at the producers and that. There has for many years not been enough invested into greenfields projects to to meet the demand side of this. And and that's why you're seeing this price squeeze coming through and and why it's run hard. Yes, we've seen it um, trade sideways for for the last month. Um, But I think 
at this stage, a lot of it is still speculation driven and not actual demand driven. And I think the what one needs to look at and see if this comes through. And and again, this ties into the whole economic growth theory and, and the decline in interest rates and economic activity kicking up, which will actually drive demand. And one is to see if that's this speculative move of recent is converting into a into the real demand off the back of what the what the, the narrative is, i.e. supply shortages, speculative demand converting into um, actual demand off the back of economic growth. So I think they all tie together, but I do think um, I do I do think the thesis is solid at this stage. Yeah, uh, a, a question coming from Sarah. She's saying she thought it was ten thousand dollars. Sarah, you get copper per pound and you get copper per ton. Yep. I don't know why we have the difference. Yeah, maybe you do. Uh, but if I understand, this is the per pound price, and this is the reference price for the the, the Standard Bank Copper ETN. Well, any idea why this? Because everything else is like a standardization to what a barrel is or an ounce or something, and then Doctor Copper comes along and says we're going to do pounds and tons. So, so it's, it, it, it depends on <laughs> which exchanges it trades on. And again, copper copper per se uh, does not trade in the spot market. It actually changes, traders trades more actively on the futures market. And you would have the different futures markets um, that would price it in pounds or in, in tons. Um, we, we generally talk about it in tons, but I see your graph was, was pounds, yeah. yes. Now, my provider has never heard of copper in tons, so they gave me a pound price. But I have I have looked in the yeah. past, and there's a slight variance, but broadly the chart pattern looks 99.9%. Uh, it's the same. They're the same. A question coming through, why doesn't my provider let me put these ETFs and ETNs in my tax-free account? Uh, quite simply because not allowed to. Um, that's not your provider being nasty. That is just what the, 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 the rules are. Um, that's Mr. Taxman. Yeah, the, the tax SARS. SARS. Uh, yeah, uh, they don't don't come and uh, hit us for that. Uh, it, it it really is them. Also, some some the 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 a point a statement comment rather more than a question. I mean, the whole BHP Billiton uh, Anglo American story is to a fair degree, if not largely exclusively, yes. driven by copper. I mean, that's BHP saying, you know yep. what, we could go and build a mine. Or we could just buy Anglo American and kick out everything we don't like. Yeah, and um, and that's why you see that two of the conditions are the one is that that uh, Anglo American platinum um, needs to be split out, and I think Anglo currently holds about eighty percent of the free float. Yeah, and the same of Kumba. It's it's also yeah. around, and, and that needs to be disinvested by Anglo. And then we want uh, we want effectively. What Anglo's crown jewels are is is its copper interest, uh, specifically in South America, and um, they believe that the cost of taking over and, and buying those mines and developing them further is cheaper. And I think if you look at the the analysts and what they say, they roughly price that, or previously priced that at around I think it was thirteen thousand, twelve thousand to thirteen thousand um, dollars a ton. Um, and that's that's roughly where where the price of of the of the bid comes through. Yeah, no, a hundred percent on that. A question coming through, another one from Tender Seas, where uh, saying not much liquidity always in these different ETFs and ETNs. Not wrong, but also not right in the sense that you've got a market maker, yeah. so the liquidity is there if I need it, both on buy and sell side, which is important. So, so the just a. The liquidity of the ETFs and the ETNs are driven by the underlying markets. Let's use gold as we're picking on gold. So let's use gold. Mm. Gold Global gold trading is of the biggest. And the rand dollar trading is also it's, it's massive. You're talking billions a day. So that is your liquidity of your ETF. Oil being the underlying for ETN, that is it. Why the market maker doesn't always put massive bids and offers on the screen is because these commodities effectively trade uh, 24 6. You have a lot of, let's call it algo trading funds, and, 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 and um, uh, uh, call it predatory trading algos 
trading across the globe the whole time. And where you are out of sync with pricing, um, they will take advantage of that and arbitrate uh, and arbitrage the actual market maker. So, so keep trading. It will always be refreshed and there's a lot of yeah. liquidity. But the other good thing that you do know is that your price that you're paying for that ETF is very much in line with what someone would pay for a gold ETF in America or in Hong Kong or anything. Because as soon as they get out of kilter, those those algo traders will take advantage of that. So you, you do know that the price you're paying is a fair one. Yeah. So and but- the liquidity hasn't been an issue. I, I've hit, and I forget what the number was. There was X amount on offer. I took it and within a second, there was more volume back and I could pick up again. So th- there was a uh, uh, suffice there. A great question coming from Stuart, and I don't know what the answer is, but Stuart says, what's the ideal commodity holding in a portfolio? Stuart, I was always taught around 5 or 10%, but I don't know if that's necessarily correct. Johan, I mean, is there a, a sort of a, a, an ideal efficient portfolio theory that says how much we should be holding? I think I think for me is you have to look, I personally look at it in two ways. Mm-hmm. The one is, and, and you have to split it out between gold and, and gold, a good gold holding is anywhere between five and 10%. Yeah. And, and, and as a, as my view is that's, that's a bit of an anchor in your portfolio. It gives you a bit of hedging against inflation, rand dollar, yeah. and, and it's just a global. So, so that gold on its own, then the other commodities you have to look at in terms of what the economic, um, movements are as well as supply demands and in that you increase and decrease your hold in that commodities depending on your specific view of one the economy uh, the economy two the specific commodity and three its supply and demand impacts across the goal uh, across the globe and and on that basis you increase and decrease i.e thematic views let's let's call it thematic yeah. views and, yeah. and and you trade around the other commodities is my an increase and decrease that's how i personally look at it yeah i take that i like the five to ten percent in gold and the others there would be points at which you don't want oil or perhaps copper or yeah. whatever it might be and there'll be yeah. points where you probably want a, a a fair a fair chunk of it uh folks i'm not seeing any more questions coming through um Johan, really appreciate your time today uh, ladies and gents, appreciate everyone else's time. Uh, Johan, I, I think I want to go back to, to kind of where we started at the beginning of the presentation, which is we've got the election tomorrow and lots of hype around that. And that will impact the czar, make no mistake about that. But yep. uh, commodities, as I was saying up front, 20 years ago, truthfully, I think even 10 years ago, outside of Kruger Rands or mining stocks, Getting commodities into a portfolio was nigh on impossible if I wasn't an institution. These days, it really is it's not just easy and available. It's actually easy and available at, at, at really, really competitive costs. I mean, 25 points to yeah. hold gold is way cheaper than hiding it in a, in a vault somewhere. Yeah. It's a, it's a, uh, I, I reiterate, it's an institutional grade product yeah. available to everybody. Um, and, and there's no better way for me to, to state that. Um, it's gone to such an extent that institutional investors in, in terms of our own regulations, call it the FSCA, is not allowed holding commodities outside of ETFs and ETNs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, so CIS funds and that cannot actually go and buy gold outside of an ETF or ETN. It's yeah. it's not allowed even anymore. Yeah. So, no, when one of the big asset managers goes into a commodity, and you, as a retail investor, go into the commodity, you're in the same space, uh, and if uh, and 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 you t- got the same security around it. And the same costs and 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 belts and braces. Yeah, absolutely. It's that same cost. It's the same. It's literally the same thing that we're all holding. Uh, Johanna Rasmus, uh, executive director at One Invest, and of course uh, 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 also working at the Standard Bank. But always appreciate the time. Always appreciate the insights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. And ladies and gents, appreciate your time. Uh, as I always say, you had uh, plenty of options where you could have spent time on your Wednesday morning. You chose to spend it with us. We are thankful for that. Look after yourself. And as always, if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.